Bram Duffy, and I'm a research fellow with the Institute for Social Innovation at Fielding Graduate University. I'm a paramedic that does uh, critical care and 911 and have been in the field for 25 years. I've also taught over 60 college level classes in areas like communication, leadership, and EMS. And my own research dives into how paramedics communicate and, and patient uh, outcomes that result. I actually have a research study open now for paramedics. So if you don't mind being interviewed by, by me, then go to my website at professorbram.com. That's B-R-A-M. And click on current research tab to find more out and be able to apply. What we do together in this podcast is all about discovery and learning and enabling you to be equipped with knowledge that can take EMS research data to the streets because sometimes this stuff can be elusive. It's a lot of times that we find ourselves with paid walls and things that prevent you from being able to get a hold of research without subscriptions. But when we work together in this podcast, we can learn more together and take a deep dive and do an intellectual adventure together. So whether you're a doctor, researcher, nurse, paramedic, EMT, this is a podcast vlog that's designed just for you. Before we get started, I want to share that I've written two books on communication, one of which was just out, released called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can find a link to the book below. Also, for sure, hang out to the end and I'll tell you more about it. So today we're here to meet Rowan Tualvi, who is the Director of Education at the California School of Health Sciences. And um, we're going to be able to talk about work and family conflict experienced by paramedics during COVID-19. And her dissertation was called Sources of Role Conflict, a Critical Evaluation of Emergency Medical Services Work, Family Conflict During the COVID-19 Paramedic. She has a PhD in Fire and Emergency Management Administration with a focus on emergency and disaster management from Oklahoma State University. She's also a paramedic and registered nurse with a master's degree in emergency health services. And so I'm so happy to have you here with me today to be able to talk about your research and, and from your own expertise. And so tell me, uh, tell me about yourself. Other, th What else can we learn about that I didn't already cover? Okay. Uh, hello, Professor Brown. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. I'm so happy to be uh, to be here uh, to talk about my PhD dissertation. Um, well, uh, just to add to what you've mentioned, um, up to my knowledge, I'm the first female in the Middle East uh, to have a PhD degree in disaster and emergency management, actually. And I also was among the faculty team who established the first paramedic bachelor program in Jordan, and the Middle East too. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations for that. I, and thank you for that type of work. That's, that's a real mission of love to be able to help people, you know, get that level of care. Absolutely, yeah. So um, to talk about um, your research, I, I'd like to share some of the notes I have that I, that I took and then um, bug you with some questions. And your research study looked at um, how, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic was something that put an enormous strain on the healthcare systems worldwide. And one aspect that commonly gets overlooked is just the impact that had on EMS providers. And it's surprisingly that there's limited research on how their roles during this crisis affected them personally and professionally, because I think it was an intense thing. This was a um, a study that was really recently done that sheds light on this. And you were able to look at the conflicts between work and family life that EMS providers encountered during this COVID-19 pandemic. And the question of the heart of all of it was, what are the sources of work-family conflict among EMS providers during COVID-19? And so you were able to find 30 EMS providers from across 20 different U.S. states, and all of which got interviewed for the study. And then I know that you use software to analyze the data and uh, develop themes. And um, the study, when I looked at it, was, was um, showing that EMS providers 
you do face this unique set of challenges during the pandemic. And there were three categories that that, uh, we, that were revealed. One was strain-based conflict. And then this was the fears about their roles, like not having enough resources for PPE or have the training that they think they need and a lack of trust in employers. Uh, the other thing was time-based conflict, which was this, this increased workload and mandatory overtime. So uh, family were stuck at home, not working, and they were working like extra, extra. And then the other thing was behavior-based conflict where providers had to take extra precautions, which could lead to really negative emotions and and limit their reaction, their interactions with family members. So strain-based conflict, time-based conflict, and behavior-based conflict is really um, interesting to see the depth that comes, you know, with, with those, um, with those labels that you were able to code. And I don't think that it's just, um, interesting there. This is really useful. This kind of thinking can help in, enhance EMS education and inform health policies and, and, um, take care of responders and their families differently. And of course, help with planning for when we have to deal with Ebola or some other nightmare. But um, ultimately, we hope that future crises will be better because folks, these these um, these folks were able to um, bear their soul to you to give um, honest feedback about what it was like for them. So, tell me about your research method methodology because some folks may not be familiar. Yeah. Um... So my research aimed to gain uh, a deep understanding of work-family conflict. So I chose a qualitative research design because this design allowed the participants to share their personal experiences in responding to a COVID-19 pandemic. So the participants' uh, participation was limited to EMS personnel only with uh, uh, experience of working during COVID-19. So uh, I started by contacting a typical case who is a pioneer in the US-based EMS field, uh, who has an extensive experience in, in EMS, fire, and public health in actually almost 48 states uh, out of the 50 states. So uh, I contacted him by email and discussed the purpose of the study, the research questions, and the inclusion criteria. And then he subsequently connected me with different EMS directors through different states, and I started from that point. So I utilized a snowball uh, sampling method to find the participants. So at the end of each interview, I asked the participant to recommend a coworker or any uh, other EMS provider in a different state or even in the same state that would like to uh, participate in order to continue with the interview. So I was able to interview, as you mentioned, 30 EMS personnel from 20 different states. And then I used, of course, a semi uh, a structured interview approach uh, in order uh, to encourage the participant to respond freely and openly to my questions. So each interview lasted between 40 to 60 minutes. And these interviews, of course, were audio recorded with the participant's approval. And then, uh, as I mentioned, the inclusion criteria was only to be an EMS provider who responded during the pandemic and who is living with uh, a family, of course, to be able to investigate the work family conflict sources. Did you ask for them to be full-time workers? Uh, yes, to yeah. be full-time workers also, yes. Mm -hmm. So then the type, what types of uh, questions did you ask that got to the heart of this matter? So the first question and the biggest one was, uh, what were your concerns during responding to COVID-19 pandemics? Because uh, I wanted to start with, the, with this question uh, um, to dig in uh, to these concerns and the stressors or strains uh, about their um, responding. What, what were the most surprising findings that you had? Well, um, it was the lack of protective gear. Um, I know that maybe at the beginning uh, um, of this pandemic, it was expected and not surprising um, as this was a large magnitude, of course, pandemic that made it difficult to ensure all of the appropriate number of PPEs, um, not only in the US, of course, but uh, all around the, the world. But what was surprising is how fast the stockpiles in most of EMS stations 
were consumed and how there was no alternative resources for most of them. So this is a big indication that the healthcare system is still not well prepared to respond to a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So the organization has to add how to find an alternative and extra sources of protective gears, of course, into uh, the comprehensive plan. So the EMS participants uh, um, and their families were really anxious and concerned because of this shortage. Some of them reported they have to reuse their masks, especially the N95 mask, of course, um, this caused them to feel unsafe in their workplace as they were not sure how to protect themselves or their family members if they can change the PPE and prevent the contamination. Uh, also, most of the participants, they felt angry because they they have only one N95 mask that is available for the whole shift. So they felt that there was some type of negligence regarding the, the to their safety. Uh, of course, which caused them added stress and uh, anxiety. Yeah, and so for those viewers who don't um, or are not in healthcare yourself, we went from one year of being fit tested with an N95 mask to make sure that you could not smell any external source, you know, from the fit of the mask being so perfect and that being so important. We went from that to you wearing a mask that's maybe two weeks old that has body oil on it and makeup and and has definitely have been exposed to lots of COVID patients and COVID particles. And so it was like a nine day, it was that alone was pretty overwhelming. The, the, the safety gear just wasn't there. I, yeah. I was there for it too. And um, I understand why it was uh, some of the most, you know, uh, big deal findings. Cause it's a fact that it happened, but the emotional components, you know, are, are big. Yeah. Um, so the results came out with these three uh, conflict areas, so strain-based, time-based, and behavior-based. Um, when we say it like that, it just seems so simple. But to, can you get um, share more about your uh, your findings there? Sure. Um, so these are the the three factors of the work-family conflict, um, which which is a significant source of strain uh, actually for EMS uh, providers and other healthcare workers. So for strain-based conflict, um, it caused a lot of stress among the participants, particularly because of their concerns about their safety first and then the safety of their families and loved ones. So. Also, the uncertainty regarding this pandemic, because it caused a lot of concern among all of the participants, because uh, um, they indicated that they never know what they are walking into through their work. Mm -hmm. um, also, lack of information regarding this pandemic and lack of transparency, transparency and appropriate communication. There was kind of communication failure between the EMS stations and other related organizations. So um, um, some of the employers failed also in communicating all the required information to the providers during uh, this pandemic. And this caused a lot of a strain among the EMS providers. Now, regarding to time-based conflict, it's related to the inability to fulfill um, the task in one role as expected. So because of having to devote more time in an other role, of course. So the increased workload and the mandatory overtime caused a lot of negative emotions among the participants as they have less time, of course, to spend with their families and loved ones. Now, Regarding the third factor, which is behavior-based conflict, all of this stress, the exhaustion, and the anxiety cause the participant to show unexpected behaviors uh, with their family members. So some of them choose to um, limit their interaction with their family members when, when they are back from work um, until they make sure they disinfect themselves. Uh, also, there was an obvious effect on the familiar relationship because of being stressed and overwhelmed during the pandemic. Uh, um, and the lack of appropriate protective gear, of course, and the lack of adequate knowledge about the pandemic added more and more stress and negative emotions, specifically um, among the participants. So these three factors cause a lot of uh, family work uh, conflict for the EMS. Uh, providers who participated in this study. Mm -hmm. And so 
were there any personal stories or antidotes that you got out of some uh, some of these folks that really stood out to you? Um, actually, yes, there are some stories. They they were surprising to me because uh, um, uh, um, they were related to the feeling of being socially isolated during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So some providers felt that they had to stay home and their time off so they will not expose other family members and friends. But some other needed uh, uh, their own private space to process what they have to deal with at work in order to meet the behavioral expectations, of course, when, when dealing with family members. Yes, we can consider these behaviors as expected and within normal limits. However, some of the providers showed unexpected, overly cautious behaviors. So they isolated and separated themselves away from other coworkers uh, as they were very anxious to be exposed to the uh, virus. So one participant, I remember he mentioned that some providers show um, some interesting adaptation to, to the pandemic. So there have been a few people who have relegated into cells like in a completely separated area, mm -hmm. uh, like greater than six feet distance. And um, he mentioned that they used to cook with each other, to eat with, with each other uh, at the station. But there was uh, uh, some people who would bring their own meals instead of during uh, the pandemic. Uh, some other will spend like most of their day uh, out in their cars and some others will stay in the engine because they become very apprehensive about providing patient care during this pandemic. So we can see how, how this pandemic caused a huge stress for EMS providers. But the good, the good thing about this, almost all of the providers is still reported to work in spite of all of the stress and anxiety that it caused. Um, although some reported that the sick leaves uh, increased during the pandemic, but there was strong evidence that this was related to the not, uh, uh, to the uh, unwillingness to participate, not related, I mean, to the unwillingness to participate, but it was related to um, the policy of having any provider with fever right. to stay for home um, for at least 10 days uh, if they have a fever. So which is a good thing actually the willing to straight is is good i think that it was really um some because there was a lack of information at the time everyone was afraid that they were going to be the one that killed their mom or killed their kid from giving them the virus and i guess if you work around the virus every day and you your family all of a sudden gets it it's really clear who killed i mean i i'm being really dramatic but i think that that's one of the things that was that was uh in the back of folks mind they wanted to do the right thing and and the, the lives of their families were were um, it was in jeopardy and it, it, they felt maybe is that is that one way to see maybe or is that too dramatic or is that one way no, to, to see what you've mentioned uh, was most of the participants exactly mentioned this, uh, they, th that they were afraid to uh, transfer the uh, uh, virus to their family, to their loved ones, uh, and as you've mentioned, to be a cause of death for them. So yeah, they uh, um, most of them, they used extra precautions actually to uh, protect their families. So most of them, even uh, I can say all of the 30 participants all of them change their uniforms before they get into a house. So in the garage, in the car or whatever. So the most important thing is to change before and to take shower uh, in the bathroom that is away from the other family members. So yeah, it's okay. not dramatic at all for them. When I was um, going through this, I, through the pandemic, I was lucky because my partner on the ambulance we were connected all the time so it was one of these situations where I always got the same partner which was helpful but you know he and I were really cautious because I had someone that was immunocompromised that lived in my house and he had a newborn daughter and so like everything you know the, it, it um and everything would um you know in our worlds could come tumbling down it's just really a scary scary thing and that's why it's it's so good to bring these things to light because, you know, 
is it really that just dramatic talk or was this real? And I think your research shows that this was real. Was real specifically at the beginning of, of this mm -hmm. pandemic. So we can say the first couple of weeks, the first month uh, of responding to this pandemic. It was dramatic actually for all of us, right? Not only for, let's say, for the EMS or healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. So what can be done to better support people that have to manage work and family conflict when crises like this happen? Um, so as you've mentioned in a little bit, one of the most important uh, thing for the providers was the uh, su support from co-workers or the biggest one is, is family in it. So most of the uh, participants expressed there uh, that the support network that comes from the family or from the co-workers co made them more resilient and more able to deal with their concerns. So we can say that communication is essential. Um, moreover, um, maybe maintaining the health and well-being of the provider is uh, of the providers is also essential to enhance their immune system for uh, um, being able to cope with the resulting stressors. We can say it is inevitable to feel exhausted, of course, and isolated during the pandemic, but at least coping with this stress in a healthy way can result in more resilient EMS providers who are resistant to stress. Uh, fatigue and feeling or uh, uh, overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, one one more thing is to implement extra precautionary measures help a lot uh, in decreasing their stressors and concerns, as we've mentioned. So cleaning the truck before uh, uh, the start of the shift and in between patients, wearing appropriate protective gear, washing hands, uh, thoroughly cleaning the work uniform and taking it off before entering the home and after shifts. All of these strategies help the providers a lot to feel more comfortable, more safe, and less concerned, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that my family did for me that made a big difference during the pandemic was they they helped protect my sleep. You know how everybody needs sleep, but this is a time when we have to worry about keeping our immune systems up. And then it's just the amount of hours that we put in, it means that it's not safe to have, um, to go without sleep. So uh, to, to, the, to that end, um, my if you go to the front door of my house, you'll see a sign that says... Um, so if you try to deliver a package, you'd see the sign. It says, night shift worker, do not knock, call by phone only. And that's because like, <laughs> if you wake me up, it, it could potentially ruin my whole next day. You know, it depends on where you catch me in that cycle. Yeah. And so for me, that's what, that's what it was. Yeah. Um, what, uh, how can the general public or maybe the, EMS managers, you know, like the administration, how, how can they help alleviate some of these pressures? Because I think that um, the general public may not understand everything and then EMS management may not have resources. So, but how can, how can these folks still play a role to make things better? So, uh, um, of course, in order for the EMS providers to respond safely during the pandemic, they must have a safe working environment. This is the most important thing. How we can achieve this? We can achieve it through having a strong organization and re uh, leadership, actually. Uh, this leadership has to address the concerns of its provi uh, uh, providers. Um, also, having a clear organizational guidelines for safety and well-being of the providers and creating a consistent communication with the providers. Now, during this pandemic, EMS providers complained about the lack of education and the training regarding pandemic. So uh, also infection control and the use of PPEs. So it's, it's always unreasonable for the employer to assume that all the EMS providers know how to don or doff PPEs without contaminating themselves or others. So there is a, a truly need uh, uh, to train all of the providers, even the senior ones, uh, uh, on how to practice this safely and to keep it in the uh, continuous uh, education program. Yeah, because uh, even though I had clinicals in surgery, I didn't actually get a proper understanding. The only reason I know how to do that process is because I've had extensive COVID, um, sorry, um, training on Ebola. And so all the Ebola training I've had really, really set. But if I hadn't had that, no. Exactly. And this is what most of the 
uh, um, uh, participant mentioned, Ebola was was years ago. So uh, mm -hmm. after Ebola, there was no more training programs regarding to infectious control. So this was a big deal. Um, yeah, some some of them do not know how to uh, wear or even take off uh, their PPE. So it was it was a big deal for them. Um, also, uh, another Im very important thing, I think employers should be responsible about um, communication uh, with the provider's family because this is going to reduce their stress and concern. So it's important to keep the family informed with the updates during the pandemic uh, in order to keep the providers themselves calm, stable, and more focused uh, on, on their work. So this can be uh, uh, helpful for them. Now, one last thing that uh, employers can do is to provide mental health care and encourage the EMS providers to use the available resources. I know that most of the EMS stations have uh, available mental health programs, but unfortunately for some it was inconvenient because of the many steps that involved in the process or inconvenient because of the nature of the uh, EMS culture. Um, as seeking mental health care is considered a stigma. So it is the responsibility of the employer, employers to uh, pay a full attention to the EMS providers um, to such a, a stressful event. So they should take all possible effort to offer more social support for the providers and provide them with appropriate, convenient resources to help them. Now, one last thing, re thing regarding the public, um, we usually, and we used to uh, mention this to the public, it will help more if they do not uh, uh, misuse the uh, EMS system. So if they do not uh, call 911 for all types of reasons uh, that uh, uh, are going to overwhelm more and more the system and maybe make, make us respond to unnecessary uh, uh, events uh, or scenarios or situations or whatever uh, um, and leave the real uh, uh, situation. My yeah. goodness. This is this is really insightful. And I just, um, I'm thinking about all of the different conflicts that happen. And you had mentioned mental health. I, I, I want to just share my personal belief. I think that if there's an EMS agency that can afford it, they should have a psychologist on staff or a oh, yeah. licensed mental health worker because they can provide counseling right there. And it is definitely well worth it if we're trying to keep people in the field long term because early interventions like that, you know, can uh, prevent long term um, uh, mental health problems that we know are out there, like the uh, the PTSD, anxiety, depression that go with um, the forced coping skills that, you know, that, that come out of this kind of work. So, you know, I know that there are some, there's some resources, but if, if the community has the money and there are communities, lots of them that have the money, uh, I, that would be the number one advocacy thing that, uh, that I would push for. What, what do you say about my ideas? Uh, I think it's a great one. And actually, uh, some of the participants mentioned uh, uh, something about having psychiatrists in, in the, um, during the pandemic. So this, I think this is a great, a great thing to uh, at least mitigate all of these, uh, um, as you've mentioned, mental issues. And unfortunately, I did not uh, mention this in my dissertation, but unfortunately, some of the participants do really have PTSD sign and symptoms and they were diagnosed to have these. So we need to mitigate this even before the start of any pandemic. We never know that if, if uh, another pandemic is coming uh, and we don't know when it's gonna come. So it's always a, a great idea to uh, uh, prepare ourselves uh, in order to prevent from the beginning uh, having these um, issues, I think. So yeah, yeah it's a it's one thing for an employer to give lip service to saying, I care about you as an employee. And it's something totally different to provide the service there that says, hey, we want you to be with us long term. We care about you. We care about your family. And um, I have a friend that was um, uh, the, he works for the Houston Fire Department and he's an EMT firefighter and he was having marital problems. And he told me really clearly that 
that the on staff psychologist that that uh, you know that works full time for the fire department. I don't know if they still have the program, but at the time they did, mm -hmm. it was someone that pretty much only counseled firefighters all day. That was so that someone that understood the work and the this this uh, dynamic that you studied here, the work and family you know aspects. And he made it really clear to me that him having a psychologist to go and and talk to saved his marriage just flat out. It was, it was, you know, night and day and he was a, such a happy person for it. And I uh, commend that, you know, those kinds of operations. So, you know, Dr. Rowan Talby, thank you so much for being with us today. I have your information down below so that people um, can connect with you. And I want to just uh, remind folks that uh, you're at the California School of Health Sciences and you're the director of education there. And uh, it's so good to to get all this time with you. So thank you again for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I want to also invite you to check out my latest book. The book was rated as Amazon's newest number one release in the emergency medicine category, which was pretty awesome. I co-authored this book with Four Arrows, who has two doctorates and is an expert on indigenous scholarship and hypnosis. So I just want to invite you to check it out because we introduce a method for communicating with patients on the scene of the emergency that takes advantage of some of the properties found in hypnosis. This book works to change the way we approach and interact with uh, any patient who's in acute distress, and it's going to help you become a better practitioner. So the book is called Hypnotic Communication in Emergency Medical Settings for Life-Saving and Therapeutic Outcomes. You can follow the link below to find it or go almost anywhere um, online to, to grab it. And if you contact me with proof of your order, I know I'm selling something here. It's, it's, I shouldn't be. I don't make any money from this. I want you to get these messages. But if you contact me with proof of your order, I'll be happy to mail you an autograph sticker that's designed to be put on the jacket uh, inside cover. I'm doing a research project related to paramedics who live in the United States, and I could use your help. If you don't mind being interviewed by video call, go to my website and fill out a form at www.professorbram.com. That's Professor B R A M.com. Just thank you for listening. I look forward to sharing more insights with you in the next episode. If you enjoy this EMS research, please tell your friends, like, share, and subscribe to help others get the message, and then stay tuned for the reference credit at the end.